When we think about the abuse that happened in Mia's home, we get a complicated picture. Dylan claims to be a victim of Woody Allen, but this goes against most of the court testimony and investigations. And despite the totality of evidence that suggests Woody is not guilty, Dylan insists that she's telling the truth. He might make that claim. He would say that she was filled with rage after his affair with Suni had been discovered and that she was out for revenge and full of rage. And what I don't understand is how is this crazy story of me being brainwashed and coached more believable than what I'm saying about being sexually assaulted by my father? Because your mother was very angry so that she would try to coach you and try to get you to turn against your father. Except every step of the way, my mother has only encouraged me to tell the truth. She's never coached me. And according to Mia, Soon Yi was also a victim, groomed by a predator. How do we move forward from this? The only way to get more context is to look at what life was like in Mia's home. And when we look at Mia's home, we do see that there may indeed be a pattern of abuse. It's not just Dylan and Soon Yi. Thaddeus, Tam, and Lark appear to have suffered as well. But what are they victims of? And who is their abuser? They may have suffered from child neglect. And let's be clear, failing to take care of your children's basic minimum emotional needs is abuse. It doesn't seem plausible that Woody Allen abused all of these children. Did Mia Farrow abuse these children? Is it a combination? Did Woody abuse Dylan and Soon Yi while Mia abused Thaddeus, Lark, and Tam? Mia Farrow failed to save them, but that doesn't necessarily mean she abused them. It's possible that they could just be horribly unlucky. We can't blame a parent for the death of their children without facts and testimony, but it is suspect that so many of them died too young. There's a pattern, but we would need more unbiased testimony to get a clearer picture of life in Mia's home. And to Mia's credit, not all of the children ended up badly. At least one was treated exceedingly well. Ronan went to college when he was 11 years old, and Mia drove him every day to Bard College, which was 90 minutes each way. And uh, she told me that she herself got a college education because he was so excited about going to school that he would tell her the whole, uh, everything that he had learned during the day on the way home. He went on to graduate Yale Law School at 21 and won a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. Lark Previn contracted AIDS in 1998, the same year that Ronan would go to college at age 11. Mia spent three hours with Ronan every day, driving him back and forth, reviewing everything that he learned. It's almost impossible she spent that much time with any of the other kids. How is it possible that Ronan could go on to get three degrees, while Lark, his older sister, the one who did the cooking and cleaning, the one who was treated like everyone's domestic servant, the one who used to carry him around like a nanny, was still struggling? Lark had two children, who sadly were also born with AIDS. While she was trying to make ends meet, Ronan got plush internships and international travel around the world. Ronan and Mia are in fact extremely close and travel the globe to crusade for humanitarian causes together. Lark would continue raising two sick children while sick herself until her death on Christmas Day in 2008. How is it that two other Asian kids would end up dying tragically as well? None of them were able to complete a full degree, while Ronin had three. Three of these kids belong together. Three of these kids are kind of the same. But one of these kids is doing his own thing. From the custody battle, it's clear that Ronin and Dylan got the benefit of child therapy from Dr. Susan Coates and Dr. Nancy Schultz. But it doesn't seem like Lark, Thaddeus, and Tam received any therapy, even though it's obvious they sorely needed it. Why not? Are only some of these kids worth the investment? Mia's family is extremely high profile, yet the death of these kids are ignored. They are literally silent victims. In 2013, Maureen Orth wrote a feature-length article in Vanity Fair about Mia's home. At this point, Tam and Lark have already passed away. Yet Orth describes the home as a loving home and a triumph. What exactly is triumphant about it? That only the Asian kids are dying? It's a feature-length story, yet she spends only two lines on the dead kids. She simply writes that Tam died of heart problems. This is odd. Maureen Orth also featured the Pharaoh household in a Vanity Fair article in 1992, so she was familiar with the children. In the earlier article, there was never any mention of Tam having heart issues. She was blind, but she was otherwise healthy. 
In fact, when Tam died, there was little information released in the press, only a few sentences from a spokesperson named Judy Hofflin, who basically says Tam died of cardiac arrest. But Tam was 21. This is rare in someone so young. There was no death certificate, no forensics, no investigation, no police report. The statement would amount to a cover-up. The truth of Tam's death would come out later. Orth also wrote that Lark died of pneumonia, but she ignores the glaring fact that Lark also died of AIDS and that she was scraping by, living as a maid, despite having two wealthy parents. Even though Orth ignores Thaddeus, Lark, and Tam, she does interview a whole bunch of other people close to Mia in both the 1992 and 2013 articles. She quotes Mia's sister, Mia's mother, Mia's friends, friends like Carly Simon, Rose Styron, Philip Roth, Rebecca Hamilton, Casey Pascal, and Leonard Gershey. Remember him? For instance, she has a black child. He was a crack baby. The guy who thinks that Mia has perfect parenting skills. So this is all thought out, all planned beautifully, and it all works. As you can imagine, here's the generous way Orth uses their statements to describe Mia. The best Catholic, full of admiration for her, incredibly smart. People don't appreciate how smart she is. There is nothing fragile about Mia. If Mia is not a good mother, then Yasha Heifetz didn't know how to play the violin. Warm, loving, sincere. Soon Yi used to call her good mama. She gives that delicate impression, but she's a powerhouse. Amazing amount of integrity. Mia was almost too smart for school. She gets right in the arena and does all the dirty work. She has raised nine children with no trauma. The last statement is factually not true. Dylan has trauma. There's other factual errors as well. The article claims Dylan wasn't seeing a therapist for her issues separating fantasy from reality, but instead for separation anxiety. However, Dr. Nancy Schultz was treating Dylan for a year before the custody battle, and she admits she was treating Dylan for a tenuous relationship with reality because Dylan lived in her own fantasy world, and she was absorbed in what the fantasy is and what reality was. Maureen Orth also interviews people who work for Mia, Audre Seeger, a tutor, Laurie Pierce, a piano teacher. Yet at this point, court documents already showed that the people who work for Mia felt pressured by Mia to lie for her, so they're not credible. Maureen Orth's Vanity Fair articles are so one-sided, so effusive about Mia, so bereft of investigative instincts. They include factual errors. They're so heavy on uncorroborated quotes from people close to Mia, so oblivious to the glaring facts of Tam and Lark's death, that it's hard to take Maureen Orth's journalism seriously. She is sitting in the home where one of the children died when she conducts these interviews. She literally is a few feet away from where Tam passed away, and she calls the home a triumph. However, there is one Asian child that Maureen Orth does not ignore, Soon Yi. In the 1992 article, which is in the midst of the scandal, Maureen Orth goes on and on about Soon Yi for pages and pages. But oddly, she never interviews Soon Yi directly. Instead, she cobbles together a list of quotes from other people about Soon Yi, a random tutor, people employed by Mia, a friend of the family, a girlfriend of a sibling, people two degrees removed from Soon Yi. In describing Soon Yi, she even quotes Priscilla Gilman. Who is Priscilla Gilman? Daughter of Yale Drama School professor Richard Gilman and literary agent Lynn Nesbitt and an honor student at Yale, who is a longtime girlfriend of Mia's son Matthew Previn. How does any of this qualify her to be an expert on Soon Yi? I am your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing! So let's look at how Maureen Orth paints Soon Yi from the quotes of a random hodgepodge of tenuous acquaintances. Recall how effusive and generous Orth was in describing Mia. Well, the picture she paints of Soon Yi is exactly opposite. According to these quotes, Soon Yi had serious emotional issues. The most learning deprived, the quietest and least socialized of the children. She spent hours on homework it took others half an hour to complete. Because of her learning disabilities, she took the SATs untimed. Her IQ tested as slightly below average. Very deprived early language development. Socially inappropriate. Very, very naive. Trouble processing information. Trouble understanding language. She's very, very literal and flat in how she interprets what she sees and how she interprets things socially. She misinterprets situations. In reference to the single statement Soon Yi ever made to the press, the article casts doubts that Soon Yi could have written the statement to the press. The article even uses an unattributed quote to say, Soon Yi doesn't know half those words, what they mean. 
Or, if you prefer, in the words of the girlfriend of a brother and the daughter of a professor and the daughter of a literary agent who's an honor student who has zero relationship with Sun Yi, Sun Yi's words are not her own. According to Gilman, Sun Yi's words belong to Woody Allen. The article's implication is clear. Sun Yi is too stupid to have her own mind and therefore is Woody's puppet. These quotes are not only obviously biased, but the picture they try to paint has logical fallacies. At the time of the article in 1992, Sun Yi is in college and studying psychology. She obviously can read and write in English. Notice how Orth went out of her way to describe Priscilla Gilman as an honor student at Yale, but she doesn't point out that Sun Yi was attending Drew College. She would later go on to get her master's at Columbia. There's also no known correlation between having English as a second language, having a learning disability, and being easily manipulated. Plenty of immigrants excel in academics despite speaking English as a second language. Plenty of people with learning disabilities are fiercely independently minded. These cobbled quotes appear to be a thinly veiled attempt to assassinate Sun Yi's character as empty headed, socially inept, a cultural outsider, a naive alien, which is all code for simply being an Asian immigrant in upper class white society. So is it a wonder that Sun Yi said nothing else for 20 years? It's intimidating when you have Mia Farrow and established journalists like Maureen Orth and the weight of Vanity Fair calling you dumb, cutting you down to size as soon as you make a statement. When it comes to the war with words, these older white women don't take prisoners. How can we get to the truth of the abuses in Mia's home if the accounts of Mia's adopted children are largely disparaged and ignored in the media? And by the ways, Maureen Orth knew that her story did not align with the facts. In an interview in The Ringer, she says they were extremely careful in fact-checking. They were in a room for eight hours. The fact-checkers wouldn't let the piece be published unless they got a signed affidavit from Mia protecting them from being sued. Let's think about that. Maureen Orth knew that her story did not stand up to the facts. She also knew that it was completely biased from Mia Farrell's point of view. And she published it anyways. Recall that this scandal was a hot story. Maureen Orth was more concerned with publishing this hot story than she was for telling the truth. So much for truth in journalism. In Maureen Orth, we see the worst kind of journalism. Active criticism of a victim of abuse and willful ignorance of potential abuses involving the death of adult children with no rigorous fact-checking. It's going to be hard to really understand the abuses in Mia's home with this kind of mud in the water. If only more of those children told the truth, despite the criticism that they are likely to receive, despite the fact that their words may fall on the deaf ears of the American public. Fortunately, after Dylan reignited the accusations against Woody Allen in 2018, two of those children, now adults, did speak up. Moses Farrow was Mia's Korean-born adopted son. During the scandal, Moses was 15 years old. He grew up to be a family therapist, so he seems well-equipped to reflect on his past honestly. In 2018, at the age of 40, Moses made a blog post detailing the painful truth about life in Mia's home, and it's a very different picture than the loving triumphant home painted by the Vanity Fair articles. First, he clarifies that he's normally a private person, but he's only speaking out because of the incredibly inaccurate and misleading attacks on his father, Woody Allen. Then he clarifies an off-stated falsehood about Soon Yi and Woody. Many people seem to think Woody is Soon Yi's father, which only serves to vilify him for incest. What are you? I'll tell you what I am. I'm the paterfamilias. People forget that Andre Previn was her father. In truth, Woody and Soon Yi rarely even spoke during her childhood. More significantly, he recounts in painful detail, with numerous examples, a history of physical and emotional child abuse by Mia. What's unique about Moses' testimony is that he takes a long view. Moses believes this dysfunction is a generational issue that predates Woody Allen. It comes from Mia's own upbringing. According to Moses, Mia grew up in a messed up family with a father who tried to molest her, a depressive uncle who later killed himself, and a brother that sexually abused children. As a young adult, she had an affair that destroyed a close friend of hers. 
Moses writes, as a licensed therapist, he can see that Mia's own dysfunctional upbringing were the seeds of darkness that would later flourish in her own home and would result in the abuse of Sun Yi, Tam, Lark, Thaddeus, and himself. According to Moses, Mia was a domineering and rageful mother who may have had good intentions in adopting children, but she did not treat them well. The adopted kids were dragged down staircases, slapped around, hit on their chest, locked in an outdoor shed overnight. And contrary to the Vanity Fair image of Soon Yi being a dumb puppet, Moses points out that she was actually the most independent of the children. She was the least intimidated by Mia, which is why they fought all the time. Mia once threw a large porcelain centerpiece at Soon Yi's head. She also beat Soon Yi with a telephone receiver. And that's just the physical abuse. The emotional abuse would include humiliation and yelling, but also coaching, drilling, scripting, rehearsing, and brainwashing the kids. You had to agree with Mia's narrative or face her wrath. According to Moses, the gaslighting would follow a pattern. Now imagine you're Mia's child. First, Mia would accuse you of doing something you didn't do. She would say you misplaced the tape measure, or you drew the curtains when they shouldn't have been drawn. Yet these small transgressions would trigger Mia's rage. She would force you to admit it's your fault, and if you stood up to her or denied it, she would smack you around, until finally, in tears, you repeated her version of the story. It's only through Moses that we learn the truth about Tam and Lark's death. Recall that the Vanity Fair article said Tam died of heart failure and Lark died of pneumonia. Lark actually died of AIDS and Tam killed herself after getting into a fight with her mother. According to Moses, Tam struggled with depression for much of her life, but Mia refused to get her help, insisting that Tam was just moody. Recall that Dylan and Ronan received child therapy to attend to their emotional well-being. But not Tam, even though she was depressed. Why not? Perhaps Tam's death could have been prevented if Mia gave her the same investment that Dylan and Ronan received. But instead of getting therapy, Mia would argue with Tam, and one of their arguments led to Tam's suicide by overdose. Tam was adopted in the midst of the scandal with Soon Yi. Is it possible that Mia took out her anger on one Asian child on the other? Moses puts Thaddeus in the same camp, another victim of Mia's abuse. Moses corroborates what Dr. Susan Coates and Monica Thompson pointed out during the custody battle. Mia made all of the children hate Woody. She constantly referred to him as evil, a monster, the devil. This isn't new, but Moses claims she also told the children Soon Yi was dead to us. Mia would rage about Woody and Soon Yi so much in front of the other kids that Ronan, who was only four, would tell his nanny, my sister is effing my father. Mia seemed more intent on vilifying Woody and Soon Yi than in protecting the mental well-being of her young kids. If this is true, is it a wonder that Dylan and Ronan would grow up vilifying Woody and also ignore their sister Soon Yi? So much for trying her best to keep the family together. This is consistent with something Maureen Orth inadvertently pointed out in the Vanity Fair article. When Mia found the naked photos of Soon Yi, she shared it with the other kids. One of those kids, Matthew Previn, shared it with his girlfriend, Priscilla Gilman, whom, by the way, is the daughter of Yale Drama School professor Richard Gilman and literary agent Lynn Nesbitt and an honor student at Yale who has no relationship with Soon Yi. Mia, Matthew, and Priscilla called these photos pornographic. Why would a mother share pornographic photos of one of her kids with the other kids and let them distribute it and let them talk about it to the press? There's only one reason, to humiliate, embarrass, and shame Soon Yi. There's a term for that. Today we call it slut shaming. And let me be very clear on this point. Mia distributed images of Soon Yi that she considered pornographic without Soon Yi's consent as a way to get back at her. That's called revenge porn. Mia Farrow engaged in revenge porn against her own daughter. Those photos belonged to Soon Yi. Neither Mia nor Matthew had any right to distribute those photos without Soon Yi's consent. That's sexual abuse, and some legal experts and advocates have defined it as sexual assault. Mia also humiliated Moses in a similar fashion. According to him, as punishment for cutting off the belt loops of his pants, she made Moses strip naked and stand in the corner of the room while his older siblings looked on. Exposing your child's naked body against their will to other kids is also sexual abuse. Apparently, one of Mia's traits is that she liked to parade the adopted kids' private parts in front of their siblings as a weird form of humiliation. In summary, Moses writes, I was defeated, deflated, beaten, and beaten down. Mia had stripped me of my voice and my sense of self. 
It was clear that if I stepped even slightly outside her carefully crafted reality, she would not tolerate it. In short, it was not a happy home or a healthy one. Moses also addresses Dylan's accusations directly. I uh, was taken to a small attic crawl space in uh, my mother's uh, country house in Connecticut um, by my father. He instructed me to lay down on my stomach and play with my brother's toy train that was set up. Moses writes, it's a precise and compelling narrative, but there's a major problem. There was no electric chain set in that attic. There was in fact no way for the kids to play up there. Apparently, the attic was an unfinished storage space filled with a bunch of junk. Then he ends the blog by addressing Mia directly. You once said to me, it's not healthy to hold on to anger. Yet here we are, 26 years later. I'm guessing your next step will be to launch a campaign to discredit me for speaking out. I know it comes with the territory, and it's a burden I am willing to bear. But after all this time, enough is enough. You and I both know the truth, and it's time for this retribution to end. Moses' words seem like the product of earned wisdom and deep introspection. His account of the abuses in Mia's home are precise and measured. If true, considering what he went through, his account seems fair, not resentful. He doesn't, for example, call Mia a satanic evil person or a monster, and he doesn't say Dylan is a liar. He claims Dylan is just another victim to Mia's gaslighting, the same gaslighting the rest of the kids received. But just as he anticipated, Mia launched a campaign to discredit him. Mia, Dylan, and Ronan release statements disparaging his account. Mia calls him a liar, but she doesn't say what about his narrative is a lie. Dylan says he's a troubled person and that his account is easily disproven, but she too offers no evidence to disprove it. Why not? They could, for example, turn over the police report about Tam's death, or a death certificate. Perhaps a toxicology report would prove the Vanity Fair version of the death and show there was no overdose. Or they could show schematics or photos of the attic that counters Moses' description of it. Perhaps they would have a family photo of the children playing in the attic. Mia loved recording everything, after all. Ronan, for his part, says this is simply a campaign to discredit his sister and attack his mother. He writes, after relentless legal scrutiny of my mother's parenting and efforts to discredit her, she was granted sole custody to protect us from Woody Allen. Okay, let's think about that. First off, Ronan conflates Mia's custody of the children with Woody's guilt. But it's not the same thing. If you go over the facts of the custody battle, as we have, you see that the totality of testimony and evidence shows Woody's not guilty of molestation. Ronan also says there has been legal scrutiny of Mia's parenting. This is not true. The fact is there has been no real legal scrutiny of Mia's parenting or her behavior. If what Moses said is true, Mia gaslit Dylan into believing a false trauma of sexual assault, not to mention forcing Dylan to relive that trauma for three days. That's child abuse. If she falsified testimony while making that videotape and she submitted it as evidence, that's evidence tampering. Mia also pressured witnesses like Christy Grodeke, Monica Thompson, and Mavis Smith to tell only her side of the story. That's witness tampering and it could have resulted in perjury. And while Woody was investigated twice for the abuse of Dylan Farrow, Mia has never been investigated for the abuses of Moses, Soon Yi, Lark, Thaddeus, and Tam. And let's not forget that distributing pornographic images of Soon Yi without her consent is a crime. If Ronan truly wants to protect his mother, the phrase he should avoid is legal scrutiny. Ronan and Dylan offer up no new facts. If they did, I would have to reconsider the veracity of Moses' words, but they don't. By being offended, by calling him a troubled liar, they only offer incredulity and ad hominems, but no new data. Ironically, Mia said it's still flabbergasting that he can tell so many lies when the facts are readily available. She's right in one way. The facts are readily available. But when you read the facts from the investigations and the custody battle, they are consistent with Moses' account. There's a big irony here. Mia, Ronan, and Dylan are all self-prescribed advocates for victims of abuse. Their fame, their work, and their brand is based on sticking up for victims. Yet here they are, ganging up and attacking a victim of abuse. Claiming you care about victims while disparaging those in your own home is the very definition of hypocrisy.
Moses' words seem just as credible as Dylan's, but despite that, his account would get little attention in the media. Part of that was because he published it on his own blog. Soon Yi's account, on the other hand, was published in New York Magazine in an article written by the journalist Daphne Merkin. For the first time, the public learned about Soon Yi's origins. She remembers growing up in Seoul. She was poor, living with a single mother in a bare apartment with a concrete backyard. She remembers running away from home and living on the street and being so hungry that she tried to eat a bar of soap. One day, she was staring through the window of a bakery when a woman noticed her and bought her something to eat. The lady started asking her questions, realized she was homeless, and took Soon Yi to the police station where the officers found her an orphanage. She remembers being happy at that orphanage. Soon Yi also recalls Mia's obsession with recording her children. She didn't just record Dylan, she tried to get Soon Yi to tell a false narrative of her birth mother on videotape. She wanted Soon Yi to say her mother was a prostitute who used to beat her. But unlike Dylan, Soon Yi refused. Soon Yi's origin story was also referenced in the 1992 Vanity Fair article. According to Maureen Orth, Soon Yi's birth mother was a violent Korean prostitute who made Soon Yi kneel in the doorway while she slammed her head with the door. This woman would later disappear and left Soon Yi on the streets. Recall that in the Guardian article, Mia said Soon Yi was captured by the authorities. In Mia's desired story, Soon Yi was violently beaten by a Korean prostitute who then abandoned her until she was captured. But according to Soon Yi, she was helped by a kind woman, a concerned citizen, who fed her and took her to the police station, and they in turn found her a happy home in the orphanage. You get a much different picture of Soon Yi's origins, as well as Korean society, depending on which narrative you believe. Who gets to own their own story? Soon Yi also recalls Mia using her and Lark as domestic servants. This was corroborated by other observers who said Lark was treated like a scullery maid. According to the article, Mia couldn't be bothered with chores. While she spent her time ordering from catalogs, rearranging furniture, and talking to her friends on the phone, Lark and Soon Yi did all of the housework. They did the grocery shopping, picked up the kids from school, cooked, cleaned the bathroom, did the dishes, did the sweeping, ironed the sheets. Then there was the abuse. According to Soon Yi, Mia slapped her, beat her with a brush, called her stupid and moronic, threw a large porcelain object at her head. Mia used to hang her upside down because she thought it would help her intelligence. Soon Yi grew up realizing that she couldn't rely on her mother. In 11th grade, when she broke her ankle, she never told Mia about it because she feared Mia's anger. It was not in my vocabulary to call her for help ever. According to Soon Yi, Mia could be domineering and abusive, but also hands off and neglectful. Soon Yi was disparaged or ignored. She said Mia had no maternal instincts from the get go. They were like oil and water. She says Mia never taught her anything about tampons, bras, or makeup, and Mia never took her on any college tours. Recall Mia spent three hours driving Ronan every day. What do we make of Soon Yi and Moses' account? From other quotes, we know that Dylan, Ronan, and the Vanity Fair articles insist that the children were treated great. They all said that they were very proud to be part of that family, that they considered themselves cool and unique. Yet, Moses and Soon Yi paint a picture of abuse, humiliation, gaslighting, and living in constant fear of their mother's volatile rage. Let's entertain the possibility that both narratives are sincere. Dylan and Ronan were younger than Soon Yi, Lark, Moses, Thaddeus, and Tam. Is it possible that Mia's parenting skills improved with age? There's an off-stated wisdom that the oldest children take the brunt of their parents' bad parenting. This theory doesn't seem to hold up because older children, like Fletcher, Sasha, and Matthew, do appear to have been decently taken care of. They spoke highly of their mother in the Vanity Fair articles. Instead, a more likely theory is what Monica Thompson and Jane Reed Martin observe, that some of these kids are treated better than others. And it's not based on age. Soon Yi tells us, there was a hierarchy, she didn't try to hide it, and Fletcher was the star, the golden child. Mia always valued intelligence, and also looks, blonde hair, and blue eyes. All of the abuses in Moses and Sunyi's accounts were only committed against the Asian kids. It's hard to draw any other conclusion. Mia simply treated the white children better than the Asian ones. The Asian children dealt with neglect and abuse. They had to deal with the drudgery of endless housework. They were treated like servants, they had to cook and clean and take care of the other kids. They were berated, yelled at, they were told they were moronic, stupid, and liars. 
They were made to get naked and humiliated in front of their siblings. They didn't get college tours. They were slapped around, hit on their chest, dragged down staircases, and locked in outdoor sheds. They had objects thrown at them. They were emotionally neglected. Mia yelled at them and fought with them and drove them to suicide. Meanwhile, the white children didn't have to do the housework. They got their mother's investment in their education. They got child therapists to attend to their mental well-being. They got driven by Mia to college every day. They weren't forced to strip naked and be gawked at by their other siblings. They weren't humiliated. They got flown around the world. They got easy internships working for UNICEF. In short, the white kids got their mother's love and encouragement, while the Asian kids got her anger, her need for free labor, her beatings, her neglect. Soon Yi's account is consistent with Moses' account and the testimony provided by other neutral observers from the custody battle. Her account seems just as credible as Dylan's, but as you can imagine, journalists and bloggers didn't like it at all. They simultaneously criticized the article while ignoring Soon Yi's words completely. Patrick Coleman, writing for Fatherly, tells us we can essentially ignore Soon Yi because Woody Allen is still a creep. He writes, there's nothing in Previn's account to convince anyone that Allen isn't an opportunistic predator who groomed a young girl into a disconcertingly young wife. Except there is. Soon Yi tells us they didn't begin dating until after September 1991. She was 20, a psychology major in college. These journalists seem unable to focus on Soon Yi's words. Coleman spends more of the article writing about Woody. Christina Cotarucci, writing for Slate, makes the same assessment. Ironically, she claims that the piece is a failed attempt to center Soon Yi's own narrative. But then she herself refuses to center Soon Yi's narrative at all. Not once does she even reference the abuses that Soon Yi claims to have suffered. When she does focus on Soon Yi's actual words, she does so only to attack her memory of events, but ignores Soon Yi's struggles, her life as a runaway, her life as an orphan, living as an immigrant under a domineering mother who humiliated her and beat her. And most significantly, Kataruchi makes no reference to the fact that Soon Yi is a survivor of abuse. Instead of responding to Soon Yi's claims of abuse, Kataruchi dismisses her completely by implying Soon Yi is a puppet of Woody Allen. However, her testimony is consistent with Moses' account, so I suppose in Kataruchi's mind, this makes Moses a puppet too. The abuses are also corroborated by Monica Thompson, who witnessed some of the abuse firsthand. Perhaps she too is a puppet. Nicole Clark, writing for Vice, makes a similar assessment. She says the New York story is framed around Soon Yi's victimization, but then she mostly ignores the seriousness of Soon Yi's abuses. At least Clark acknowledges in one paragraph the abuses Soon Yi suffered, but she characterizes Soon Yi's suffering as a wash of he said, she said. But that's not true. Soon Yi's account is corroborated by Moses and is consistent with other neutral observers and the facts from the custody battle. This is not he said, she said. This is corroborated testimony and consistent with known facts. Clark dismisses Soon Yi's suffering altogether, calling her experience anti-Me Too. Laura June, writing for The Outline, calls Soon Yi's perspective warped. She puts profile in quotes as if it's fake news. She says there's 500 things wrong with the interview, but doesn't point out a single factual error. Then she commits a factual error herself. Alan married his stepdaughter. This is not true. She reduces Soon Yi to a 47-year-old woman who has made some mistakes, but Soon Yi hasn't made any mistakes, and she has no major regrets. She does regret how Mia found out about the relationship because it was hurtful to Mia, but she has zero regrets about choosing to be with Woody Allen. June refers to Soon Yi as an orphan child of uncertain origins and an easy target, but the article clearly states that she's from Seoul, Korea, and Soon Yi doesn't seem like an easy target. She seems like a sane woman who speaks coherent English and is of sound mind and body. This journalist is simply relying on the same stereotype that Maureen Orth used in the Vanity Fair article. They want to paint Soon Yi as a naive foreigner, easily manipulated. In other words, an empty-headed puppet. This blogger says she sympathizes with Soon Yi, but it's an odd form of sympathy because she ignores Soon Yi's actual words completely. Then she disparages her by implying she may be stupid or simply bad, whatever bad means, for defending Woody. She infers Soon Yi is loyal, not logical. In other words, she's a puppet. Who needs that kind of sympathy? In my definition, having sympathy for someone means listening to what they have to say and taking their words seriously. Laura June disparages the entire article by calling it a weak attempt to let Soon Yi speak. But the fact is, it's the only attempt to let Soon Yi speak in over 20 years. Recall the 1992 Vanity Fair articles criticized Soon Yi mercilessly, but never allowed her to speak directly. 
June writes, Soon Yi gets a larger share of my sympathy than other women doing the dirty work of dirty men because she was taken advantage of, whether she knows it or can own up to it. Laura June implies that Soon Yi is too dumb to know she was taken advantage of and that she cannot own up to it. But Soon Yi does know she was taken advantage of. She just told us she was a victim of abuse and she did own up to it. She told us exactly how Mia abused and took advantage of her. When she was a child, Mia treated her like free labor, an extra domestic servant. Mia argued and ruled with rage. She lived in fear of Mia's anger to the point that she couldn't even tell her mother when she broke her ankle. Mia beat her with a brush, slapped her around. Mia threw things at her head. Mia humiliated her for learning English too slowly. She called her dumb and moronic. It seems like Laura June didn't even read the article. She says Sunyi's own words doesn't really tell us very much about Sunyi Previn as a person. And I suppose that's a matter of perspective. Laura June didn't learn very much, but it's the first time we learn about Sunyi's origins and what life was like for her before and after Mia's home. We learned that she wasn't born from a prostitute who beat her, that she was in fact a runaway, who later tried looking for her birth mother. We also learned that she was relatively scrappy, and that she was happy living in the orphanage. She wasn't saved, she was plucked. Perhaps most significantly, we learned that Sun Yi is a survivor of abuse and that she speaks cogent English. Perhaps she is simply resilient and not the dumb girl that Mia Farrow and Maureen Orth made her out to be. I'll give these writers credit for their lovely language. These journalists are obviously college educated just based on their diction. These articles are eloquently written. They pontificate about the Me Too movement with the power of a manifesto. But it's clear these journalists spend more time focusing on their words than focusing on their facts. We would be better served if they were poets instead of journalists. They don't reference how Moses corroborated Sun Yi's story. They don't look at the source material from the custody battle. They don't interview the witnesses or the investigators. They don't look for patterns of abuse in Mia's home or point out the fact that false allegations often arise during custody battles. They attack Daphne Merkin for being biased, but they don't attack Maureen Orth's more egregious bias. They use ad hominems like creepy, bad woman. They say loyal instead of logical. They call Sun Yi a puppet. We tread lightly when we think of Dylan's account. Even the few people who disagree with her attacks on Woody don't attack Dylan personally. Scarlett Johansson said she would work with Woody again. Kate Blanchard said she believes in due process. They are careful not to say Dylan was a puppet or that her account can be ignored. They don't attack her mental faculties or her memory. We treat Dylan's words seriously as we should, and we avoid ad hominems. But we trample all over Soon Yi, not just her account, but her character as a person, and we don't criticize her for her behavior, but for her association. Nearly 30 years later, and little has changed. We continue to ignore the possibility of abuse by Mia Farrow and the deaths of these adopted Asian children. Soon Yi and Moses' accounts are disparaged and ignored by nearly every journalist who wrote about this story. I wasn't surprised by this treatment for reasons I already mentioned but Daphne Merkin was surprised by the level of vitriol aimed at the article. She writes, It's strange how critics don't think Soon Yi deserves to be heard, that the abuse she suffered because it was at the hands of a woman and not a man is somehow less valid. I think the attacks on it are sexist and more than a tad racist. Now to be fair, most of these journalists don't actually try to silence Soon Yi. There's a difference between disparaging, ignoring, and outright silencing. Silencing is when you actively try to stop someone's words from even being published, which we should never do if you believe in a free press. However, there was one journalist who actually tried to silence Sun Yi. There was one journalist who tried to catch and kill her story before it was published. Ronan Farrow. Ronan called the editor-in-chief of New York Magazine to kill this story. Emails also came from lawyers, so there was a real threat of a lawsuit. Merkin writes, I wasn't used to this level of fear, fear of Ronan, of being sued, of the power of Mia and Ronan, simply culturally, their power on Twitter. Let's get the facts straight. Ronan, a self-proclaimed advocate for victims and a self-proclaimed defender of the free press. We should have the free press in this country. Reporters shouldn't be threatened. Tried to kill the story from a victim of abuse. When he couldn't stop it from being published, he went on to disparage it. As a journalist, I'm shocked by the lack of care for the facts, the refusal to include eyewitness testimony that would contradict falsehoods in this piece, and the failure to print my sister's responses. Okay, so let's think about that. In the Gail King interview with Dylan, there was no close review of the facts. Gail King also doesn't interview other eyewitnesses. In the 2013 Vanity Fair article, where Dylan makes her accusations, 
neither Sun Yi or Moses were interviewed, nor were any of the original witnesses from the custody trial who contradict Mia's narrative. Lark and Tam's death was also never investigated. Ronan was a journalist by 2013. Where was Ronan's journalistic integrity then? Where was his shock by the lack of care for the facts? Where was his need to present both sides? I do agree with Ronan on one point. He says survivors of abuse deserve better. He is right. Soon Yi and Moses deserve better. I believe Soon Yi Previn. I believe Moses Pharaoh. I also believe Dylan is a victim of abuse, but I don't believe her abuser is Woody. I don't believe Soon Yi and Moses just because their accounts, given in their own words, seem honest. I believe Soon Yi and Moses because I believe in facts. Their narrative is consistent with all of the testimony presented during the custody battle. I don't believe all of the opinions in magazines like Vanity Fair. They don't even try to hide their bias. I prefer testimony given in court, given by witnesses at the risk of perjury. I believe women, not just Soon Yi, but Monica Thompson, Christy Grodeke, and Mavis Smith, working women who put their jobs at risk and were afraid of Mia's wrath and risked perjury but ultimately told the truth. I believe Dr. Susan Coates, Dr. Nancy Schultz, and the women of the Yale New Haven research team, Dr. Julia Hamilton and Jennifer Sawyer. In fact, many of the powerful men involved in the custody battle seemed hell-bent on getting Woody. Frank Mako, a prosecutor, and Judge Wilk showed an inability to take the facts and testimony on their own accord, as prosecutors and ideological judges tend to do. But the women seemed unbiased, and their testimony seemed credible. The truth is, Mia has a volatile rage. She has a pattern of pushing her own narrative onto people. She has a pattern of pressuring them, both the women who worked for her and her own children. Mia was angry at Woody and Soon Yi. She was angry enough to make false accusations of abuse. She used Dylan Farrow in her vendetta against Soon Yi and Woody. No! It can't be! No! Dylan Farrow is a victim of abuse. She was abused by Mia Farrow, and to borrow a phrase from that other journalist, Dylan was abused by her mother. She was taken advantage of, whether she owns up to it or not. That's what I believed happened, because that's what the totality of the facts and testimonies show. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. That's true. The truth of the abuses in Mia's home comes down to who you believe. Even after Soon Yi and Moses told us the truth, None of the celebrities who demanded we cancel Woody Allen reneged or offered up an apology. No celebrities took on the cause of Soon Yi and Moses as victims of abuse. Ronan insists on the need to ask tough questions. So let's ask the tough questions. Why don't we believe Soon Yi and Moses? Their words are just as credible. Their experiences just as valid. Why do we believe Dylan Farrow? As we saw before, some people believe Soon Yi is a puppet of Woody Allen. These very same people believe Dylan is not a puppet of Mia Farrow. This defies logic. Soon Yi was 21 when these events unfolded. Dylan was 7. Who's more likely to be brainwashed by an adult? A 7-year-old girl or a 21-year-old woman? It's true that Dylan provides explicit detail, and it's a very compelling narrative, but having explicit detail doesn't make it true. He had a beard, an eye patch, and he wore a white lab coat. He was stooped, wore sandals, he used a cane, and he had a mouse on his shoulder. That sounds exactly like my dad! Why else do we believe Dylan and not Soon Yi and Moses? Is it because Soon Yi and Moses seem to have overcome their abuse while Dylan remains traumatized? Do we believe Dylan's abuse because she isn't able to overcome it? This too makes no rational sense. A person's ability to overcome crimes committed against them is no measure of the accuracy of their narrative. Perhaps people believe Dylan because they prefer a story of continued trauma. It's more interesting and dramatic. Sadly, the public likes victims to remain victims. And when they overcome it, the media has no use for them because it's no longer a story. Listen to Samantha Geimer. She was raped by Roman Polanski, the director of Rosemary's Baby, when she was 13. She had a difficult time with the trial. She was called a liar by the public. 
The judge in her case referred to her and her mother as whores. But listen to what she says about being a victim in the public eye. You also talk about the fact when, that you weren't the kind of victim that people wanted. You didn't behave in the way that they wanted. That was, that's more later than at the time. I mean, at the time, I was a really angry young girl. So I'm sure I wasn't behaving the way people wanted me to then. Um, but later, people want you to be interesting and damaged and traumatized, and they'd like to exaggerate what happened to you to make it more interesting. Um, so I don't cooperate with that because that's just not who I am. So it's like a disappointment for, for everyone that I'm fine and I got over it. Samantha Geimer tells us that the public prefers some kinds of victims and it discards others. On her blog, Samantha Geimer makes this even a sharper point. She talks about how activists in the media treat survivors who are not traumatized. When I refuse to bend and show the damage that is demanded, I am a rape apologist with Stockholm Syndrome, who is bought and paid for, and most importantly, I am hurting every other rape victim who ever lived, a woman who must be mad. That is the problem with being a strong woman, a survivor, is the activists have no use for you. They turn on you the second they realize it. They need victims, not survivors. No more apologies for being a healthy, happy survivor. She goes on to say, It is sad that a confident woman who has survived a bad experience for some is not as interesting as watching someone writhing in pain. To Ms. Geimer's point, do we discard Sun Yi and Moses' account because they are happy survivors who have moved on with their life instead of being perpetually traumatized like Dylan? But this too makes no sense. As I mentioned earlier, whether or not a victim recovers from their abuse should be no measure on the veracity of their claim. Why else don't we believe Moses and Sun Yi? Is it because we privilege sexual abuse at the expense of physical and emotional child abuse and child neglect? all of which can be just as damaging as sexual abuse? If we care about abuse, shouldn't we care about all forms of abuse? And while Dylan agonizes over an incident, Sun Yi and Moses suffered decades of repeated abuse. In fact, while child sexual abuse has been on a rapid decline since 1992, child physical abuse has not declined at nearly the same pace, and sadly, child emotional abuse hasn't declined at all. In other words, the abuses that Tam, Lark, Thaddeus, Sun Yi, and Moses have experienced have not garnered enough attention, not only in Mia's home, but in the country at large. And as we have seen in Mia's home, physical and emotional abuses can lead to suicide and lifelong trauma, trauma that is just as horrific as sexual abuse. And let's not forget that Sun Yi and Moses both experienced sexual abuse as well when Mia tried to humiliate and shame their exposed bodies. The fact is, there's no real logical reason for believing Dylan and not believing Sun Yi and Moses. But there is a more obvious reason why people believe Dylan. Look at them. It's clear that the public doesn't care about abuse and violence against Asian Americans, and we also don't care much about the suffering of immigrants. The abuse of Dylan Farrell doesn't just point to long-standing dysfunction in Mia's home, it points to long-standing dysfunction in the American public. The media will always care more about the sexual abuse of a white girl than the everyday abuse of immigrant Asian children. Americans just don't care when immigrant children are physically and emotionally abused, neglected, disowned, and left to fend for themselves in a cruel world they were unequipped to handle. Yet it triggers the rage of the American public when they imagine the sexual abuse of a little white girl. White sexuality is precious in a way that destroys or silences the lives of people of color. Lest we forget, American history is a history of lynching black boys and black men just for looking at white girls the wrong way. The Chicago Negro boy, Emmett Till, is alleged to have paid unwelcome attention to Rory Bryant's most attractive wife. Stevenson's team has chronicled more than 4,300 lynchings. They continue to find more. One in four lynching victims, like Joseph Richardson and Frank Embry, were accused of unlawful conduct with white women. In nearly every case, no evidence, just an accusation, was enough. Today, 
We don't lynch black boys and black men on a mass scale like we used to, just for looking at white girls the wrong way. But it's a hard truth that we still care more about the sexuality of white girls than the abuse of people of color. Perhaps you're not convinced. While we were focused on the abuse of Dylan Farrow and infinitely obsessed about Jeffrey Epstein, there's a much larger and predatory system of child sexual abuse going on on American soil. In the Epstein case, there are 36 victims that have been identified, but some estimates are as high as 100, if not over. This is larger. It's detention centers. At a minimum, in less than a four-year period, there were 178 cases of adult staff members sexually assaulting children, but these numbers are low. These are only the ones the Justice Department is focusing on as what they deem as the most serious, but over 1,300 cases were referred to the Justice Department. Over 4,500 cases were received by the Office of Refugee Services, and the numbers spiked especially after the child separation policy. But all of these numbers are likely low. These children literally have no guardian, no citizenship, no home to return to. So if these are just the reported cases, the actual number of child sex abuse is much larger because sadly, these victims are even less protected than Epstein's victims. These cases include adult staff members who harass and assaulted children, including fondling and kissing minors, watching them as they showered and raping them. This is a scale of child sex abuse that rivals the Roman Catholic Church. And yet we hear nothing about it. Why? Because like Soon Yi, Moses, Thaddeus, Tam, and Lark, those victims are immigrant children. We care about the abuse of some victims, but we don't care about the abuse of others. Three of these kids belong together. Three of these kids are kind of the same. But one of these kids is doing his own thing. Now it's time to...